Hello, lovely humans. We're back for day 27 of our daily embodiment practice together here in December. I'm Marissa Moses, and I am the founder, facilitating guide of self-care for performers, which is a practice that evolved out of over 16 years teaching, leading, choreographing, directing, performing as an actor, dancer, all of the things, movement director. My mother was a dance instructor. My father is a martial artist. I grew up in a community of creatives and it's just sort of all I know, which makes life and living sometimes a bit of a challenge because the way the creative mind works is not always the most conducive to the practical elements of living a life. And in this sort of socio-political climate that we have in the very capitalistic way of moving through the world, there has been a challenge in my life of finding ways to bridge into more stability, more consistency, more self-compassion, and hopefully community compatibility. And self-care for performers really was birthed out of teaching cross-departmentally at a college for performing artists where I was teaching self-care classes specifically for actors and for dancers for their respective fields and finding ways to redesign curriculum to help support them in their needs to establish a sense of self-caring experience. What I found while I was teaching those courses, two things. One is that relationship seems to be a core piece, a core component of both interest and inhibition of what keeps a lot of those of us drawn to the performing arts from feeling fulfilled in our lives and from feeling like we can show up fully into our work, our creative communities, our lives. And so relational healing is a large part of learning how to care for oneself, to care for oneself while in relationship. And as a performing artist, we are collaborators by nature. And so also learning how to communicate with collaborators and our processes and translate them into a needs-based relational dynamic, meaning here's what I need. Will you meet me here? So working with communication strategies in a kind of way has been a big component of a lot of what I do. And also identifying that sometimes our inhibitors with being able to speak to and about and from our needs, or even identify what they are to begin with, let alone communicate them is often brought into our patterns wherever we're at with them from our early childhood caregivers and what capacities they did or didn't have with communication skills and healthy conflict resolution or intimacy and being able to be vulnerable with one another and speak about what needs, wishes, wants are present, and then find ways through in connection. And then, of course, there's also our early creative training and how a lot of our early creative training also can kind of set the motion for how we continue to think about ourselves, think about one another, think about the possibilities of how we might show up into creative practice, into our performance training into our careers if we choose to fold the performing arts or creative practice into a vocation as well. And so today I am going to be entering a new book for these daily December videos. I have been leading with a book to help ground and orient us together for a day while also letting me feel like I'm held a little bit in our space that we enter into. And today's book is Designing and Leading Life-Changing Workshops, Creating the Conditions for Transformation in Your Groups, Trainings, and Retreats by Ken Nelson, David Ronka, Leslie Lang with Liz Korabek Emerson and Jim White. So it's a whole community experience of those who came in to write this together. And there is also a foreword by Stephen Cope, who is author of The Great Work of Your Life in Deep Human Connection. So yesterday, 
what we did is we treated the book I use, which was all about complex PTSD and shifting from striving into thriving. And today's we are going to use in a similar way, which is to connect with the material and then thumb to a page and allow chance, circumstance, energy, intuition, instinct to lead us and guide us into something that might be right for this moment. So I'm going to close my eyes, take a couple of breaths and ask that for all those who come into connection with this video, that we receive whatever information is best, right, most right suited for us as a community, for collective witness of whatever embodiment that I step into on behalf of the all of us who come into relational connection with this video. And then I'm just going to go till it feels right. Chapter 11, the first key, creating safe space. <sighs> Yesterday's video was touching into, well, it was, I titled it a sacred theater and really connecting to safety as a somatic experience, soma meaning body. So the body understanding there's a safety and cultivating safety and safe space between witness or audience and performer or embodied practitioner. So let's see, it feels very timely. It feels like a wonderful place to come into connection after yesterday's video. So there is a quote here by Maya Angelou. I've learned that people will forget what you said. People will forget what you did, but people will never forget how you made them feel. Maya Angelou. Hmm. Just breathe that one in. And I invite you to feel into some sort of feeling inside of yourself that you trust. And just spend a little time there as I read to you from the next portion. And it goes, have you ever been in a group that became dysfunctional? Probably if you're a performing artist, <laughs> we have a history of having groups of collaborators that maybe start off well, maybe don't, but that sometimes there's some dysfunctional dynamics in our creative circles. What were the symptoms? People talking over each other, sidebar conversations, people coming late and leaving early. In many groups, an intentional culture is never set. How to be together as a group is not addressed. It's taken for granted that gathering around common purpose is enough for participants to stay focused and productive, but this is a gamble. And we saw in Katie's story, her retreat devolved into chaos because she and her participants hadn't declared conscious group boundaries. Mm. In her group, when the rim of the circle wasn't firm enough to hold disagreements, strong feelings, and emotional discharge, people felt unsafe, unsupported, and began to act out in dysfunctional ways. In this chapter, we'll explore five ways to gather a functional group by creating a container that can support emotionally safe and effective interactions. One, get clear about your intention. Two, attend to the space. Three, set group agreements. Four, use conscious dialogue. Five, abide by ethical guidelines. So it says, get clear about your intention. As a leader, if you don't know where you want to go, any road will take you there. A better plan is to get a sense of direction. Where do you want to go? What's in it for you? And what do you want for your participants? An intention is a setting for the heart. It's a movement toward what you want. In yoga, intention or sankalpa is a way of being born from the heart. Right intention leads you towards harmony and protects you if worry or doubt arise. Here's a three-part intention. It's a way of aligning your work with what you want and who you really are before the group arrives so that you have an intention for yourself, an intention for the group, and then an intention for life. I'm going to show you a little 
model there. Intention for yourself is at the base. And then outside of that, including that is intention for the group. And outside of that, including both of those is intention for life. There's also a quote by David White that says, to have a firm persuasion in our work, to feel that what we are doing is right for ourselves and good for the world at this exact same time is one of the greatest triumphs of human existence. Part one, set your intention for life. What kind of world do you want to see? It's a great question. We're going to answer it today for myself and for self-care for performers. And you can take these practices as well and offer them into your own sense of orientation, whether they totally align with sort of mine or kind of in some ways or in many ways differ greatly. You'll have this process, these tools to be able to use for your own purposes. So part one, set your intention for life. What kind of world do you want to see? What's your promise to life? What inspires you? What breaks your heart? As Stephen Cope says, every human has a dharma, a sacred duty, a true calling. Here are some examples expressed as already true in the present moment. I am a compelling force for good in the world. I am a catalyst for positive change. I express myself creatively and share it with the world. I am an enthusiastic champion of life's possibilities. I am an instrument of peace. And then part two, set your intention for the group. What do you hope to accomplish? How do you want to serve your participants? Getting to the essence of your promises, your core outcomes will help you focus your intention. Here are some examples. We are being authentic and honest in relationships. We are exploring mindfulness in everyday life. We are developing and strengthening emotional intelligence. We are creating a vision for the next phase of life. Part three, set your intentions for yourself. How do you want to show up today? What is your mantra? How do you want to interact with the group? Getting clear about how you want to be as you lead the group can help you stay present. Here are some examples. I am present, not perfect. I am clear and focused. I am steady and determined. I am enthusiastic about what we will create. Where your attention goes, energy flows. That's a common term I hear a lot in my circles. Taking time to get clear about your intentions for life, the group, and yourself will give you a sense of dedication and clarity in your work. <sighs> so I'm going to include, there's a couple of prompts here. I'm going to include them in the self-care garden. We're going to embody today what I just read, the part one, set your intention for life. Part two, set your intention for the group. And part three, set your intention for yourself. So we'll do the embodiment today. And then there is also a list of other possibilities and ways you can incorporate this sort of practice or process that I'm going to type out and leave in a printable download for those of you who are members of the self-care garden, which you can join over on Patreon. And we have an accessibility tier there too. If the full supportive rate feels like a bit of a stretch for you, you can take the accessibility tier and you can also modify that if something feels comfy for you in between the two. And it's a month to month basis. So you can come in, check it out for a month, see if you like it and see if it's a right fit. It's also a great way to support me, to let me know that you're valuing the work that I'm doing and that you want to see me continue to show up here and show up in community with you and finding ways to build trust and connection through, through an online virtual space and through free content, as well as the supportive inner experience of the self-care garden. Ha. Huh. Oh, also on the self-care garden, we are once a month meeting for an online zoom connection. So if you would like to be there, it's on the second Sunday of each month and next month in January, that will be January 8th, I believe is the second Sunday of January. So January 8th at 10 a.m. 
if you want to pop on, we'll do a little group Zoom, a little class, a connection, and maybe a journey. I like to see who's present and feel into our hearts and then guide us through some form of experience is usually how the connection points go for these kinds of virtual spaces. <sighs> okay, here we go. For today, we're going to start with, let me take a sip of tea first. I have a lavender chamomile today. So nice. Okay. We're going to start with set your intention for life. So I'm going to stand up and embody. I am now setting my intention for life. Oh, I feel so supported from like my lower abs like there's like a lifting and engaging up so like though there's like solid core connection so if you're in ballet it's sort of like lifting the base of the pelvic floor lifting <sighs> lifting but I still feel like able to drop into <sighs> clarity in a straight spine that I have, I have sort of the technique needed to be ready to engage with life, to feel solid, to feel held in my core sense of self, while I still feel at the same time very mobile, very accessibly engageable. So there's a mobility to my availability that isn't always present for me and it feels really good my intention for life is to feel strong at my core my intention for life is to have capacity to meet any given circumstance in relational availability Feels like it. That feels like my intention for life. Um, set your intention for the group. Okay. And I'm going to do this. Ooh, I'm going to set my intention for specifically the group that is going to come into connection on the second Sunday of January, that January 8th at 10 a.m. I'm now setting my intention for our next group Zoom for self-care for performers. Oh, I feel like my whole heart is like holding this like, I don't wanna say basin, but it's like holding, lifting something. The ability to like hold, lift, carry and be in relationship with core that there's some sort of a willingness to be with a weight bearing that feels like it's related to my pelvis, like the two front parts of my <sighs> pelvis. So the iliac crest comes up and over And it feels like something in there feels really related. <laughs> I'm, I'm aware of a lot of personal experiences that I have in this region, but I know that it was, this is for the group. So my intention for the group is that we can connect to the sort of bowl of our pelvis that we can connect to baseline support in our group container, that the group container also has this baseline support, that the group container can experience a holding and a intentional heldness that each of us can come into connection and bring together that there's a willingness to come and create 
a bottom for one another so that there, if there is expressivity that needs to come out, it can be caught by group dynamics or allowed to settle into the concept of the space between us as a sort of offering bowl. <laughs> and that we can feel We can feel safe to hold ourselves, to hold each other, to be relationally honest in our heart and really true to the needs that can cultivate a sacred theater, that can cultivate the possibility that within our connection, we can hold embodiments and witness relationship, whether it's me facilitating and you taking that in, whether that's if we do any group partnered or solo work where there's an embodiment that wants to come forward, that the group is honoring that very clearly in a held way, in a supportive way, I should say. Because sometimes I find that there's a want for the covering. And sometimes I find there's a want for an unfolding or an unfurling. And the support underneath though often feels really good, even as sometimes we can also release that and allow there to be a depth of presence and a willingness to meet the sort of earthen energies that are there for us. It feels very energetically honest. It feels very relationally present while me also having clarity it's really important that I communicate what it feels like from a body-based experience to choose to align into capacity for one another for the intention of the group for the clarity of a container that can hold a sacred theater space maybe not to have a sacred theater this next iteration but to move through the parts that would could create that kind of experience organically and to touch into like a stage setting for what can be, what will be, what already is, and also what hasn't totally been. <laughs> and create really clear boundaries around how, where, when, why it hasn't totally been that. And I think I have more clarity there now. And I didn't, I wasn't able to see certain things before in order to create the clarity necessary, I think, to be with certain boundaries in order to create safe enough space to have that kind of freedom, <laughs> which is interesting. You have to have a lot of boundaries to experience a lot of freedom. You have to have a lot of support in order to fly. Okay. Oh, one more. Set your intention for yourself. Hmm. I'm now setting my intention for myself. Ah, my arms just kind of dropped to the side and I just am in my heart. <laughs> and that's kind of it. <laughs> I just not try so hard, let go of some of the pressure, just be really present. <sighs> yeah. Let myself off the hook. I put so much pressure on myself and I really feel... Like there's a requirement for me to ease that up, to fi just find systems that work, find patterns that work, find rituals that are supportive for myself and my life and in practice and in all ways of being. I just want to, there's a little cloudiness there. I want to allow myself to open space for. I really want to 
have strong enough boundaries to the point where I can really be kind to people. And I know that I can't be kind to certain within the context of certain dynamics when I feel like my boundaries are being bypassed or blown over by myself or by others. So I feel really clear that that feels so valuable to me so that I can find kindness, so that I can experience support and I can also attune to what capacity I have to be supportive, but that the systems I have set in place the practices that I trust, the dynamics that I keep coming back to and returning to, that I trust the baseline framework to do a lot of the work for me. So I don't have to try so hard that there's like a structural integrity to the way I live my life, to the processes and practices that I invite others into and that I consciously choose for myself. And now I want to dance a little. Ooh. And just listen and feel guided. Feel like I'm guiding as I'm guided. I'm guiding as I'm guided. So I'm guiding, but I'm not the one choosing <laughs> how I'm guiding. I'm allowing the guidance to sort of ripple roll through me, but it feels also very like clear that I'm moving energy. Hmm. Okay. Check it out. I think that's us today. Ah, we did it. Okay. And I think I said the things I said, the self-care garden, you know where to find us over on Patreon. Um, and if you're interested in cycling with me, I have creative connection cycles for three months, six months, 12 months. And through at the end of the month, I'm also having a holiday healing special, which is just three sessions if you want to get a little taster of connection points for three hours worth of embodiment, attunement, somatic care, self-care support, conversational hmm, conversational. creative conversation dynamics and invitations into practice either between us in the sessions and or identifying what might feel right and best for you to take into your own private practice or community settings <sighs> feels good feels good feels good all right love you enjoy my tea i'm going to enjoy my tea we appreciate you. Thank you for being here. If you'd like to make a donation, oh God, it would feel so good to just feel who's out there and to know that you have some sort of relational care for the work that I'm putting into these videos. Each video takes me three to five hours to film, edit, upload, type out all of the things by the time I have it posted everywhere it's being posted. So, and sometimes I've been doing two a day because every so often for this month, I've needed to take a day off. So it's been a lot because I'm also caretaking for my mother as well and working on my other project, Pages in Process. And um, it would feel nice to start to feel some financial reciprocity. It would feel really nice. 
I hope you're well wherever you are. I appreciate you. Thank you for taking the time to be a witness for me and to connect into your heart and to share in this virtual space. Until next time, bye-bye.